Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. This morning we're going to be jumping into John chapter 8. We'll be picking up in verse 48 here in just a couple of minutes. We want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for this Bible study. Looking at those who have already commented, we have several who are with us here today. Aline, uh, Chris Kramer, Truth and Reason. We have David Cambridge, Jerry Wilcox, and others. We want you to know that you are our welcome guests. We really appreciate you joining us for our study. If you have joined us for the first time and you are on our YouTube channel, then feel free to use the comment section connected with this live video stream. If you are on our Facebook page, then of course, leave a comment in the comment section connected to this live video stream there. Um, we'd love to hear from you. If you do, if you'd like to correspond with us, you can also send us email, send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com, questions at truthfactorlive.com, or you can email us individually as you see on the screen there. Let's say if Bob says something particularly snarky and you want to write him an email, send it to Bob at truthfactor.com. And hopefully if all things work right, he will be getting it. <clears throat> Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Everyone doing all right? Doing good. Wow. <laughs> hey, we've got our full compliment, don't we? Well, except for what's his name? <laughs> what's his name? Uh, younger fella. <coughs> Brendan? Oh, here. Brendan's here. Brendan, is that right? Yeah, Brendan's here. <laughs> I don't see him. Brendan, say hi. <clears throat> Brendan, you're Brendan. too dark. Hello. Brendan, that's Bob at truthfactor.com. Hey, Brenda. Hey, Bob. <laughs> Alive and well. You, d you don't have a good picture or you don't have a camera? or uh, I'm broadcasting. No, the rest of us see him, Bob. I think uh, I think your glasses are bad. Well, I see, I it. see him now. It's just we're brighter than Brendan today. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say every show. Every well, <laughs> just about. Just yeah, about. He just has that side light reflecting on him and so. Yeah. So, he, so, yeah. so, so he's half light and half not light. And, yeah. and I, don't, I don't know how to touch on that based on our. I'm, I'm balanced. Text. <laughs> I'm perfectly balanced. Yeah. 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 You're balanced. There you go. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Speaking of being balanced. Okay. Let's go ahead and jump into our study. We had left off last week in John, the eighth chapter. We had studied down through verse 47 and there is a statement that jesus makes during the course of this discussion here in regards to uh, abraham and he, he says there let's kind of jump back up to verse 39 um real quick he had made the comment there that if they were truly abraham's children then he says, you would do the works of Abraham. But instead of doing the works of Abraham, and we discussed this, um, um, they were trying to seek to kill Jesus there. And so he tells them, you do the deeds of your father. Then we have the whole discussion there where they said, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And then Jesus says, of course, if God were your father, then you would love me. Um, <clears throat> and then he says, verse 44, you are of your father, the devil. And we looked at that last week. And of course, that did not sit very well with him. But he does explain in 47, he who is of God, hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Now, having heard all this, we're going to look at the Jews' reply to Jesus and his response to the foolishness of their charge. So let's start our reading here in verse 48. And Paul, let's break this up just a little bit. And sure. let's read through, let's go ahead and read through verse 53. Be a rough area. Uh, I, I have my sound down a little low. Did you say 28 through 53? No, 48. I may have said 28, but <laughs> it's 48 through 53. No, I misunderstood. I'm sorry. No, you're good. You're I good. was thinking, I thought we already covered that, but <laughs> okay. Uh, John 8, 48, and I'll read down through verse 53. 
Okay. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> so, Paul, this is, it is an interesting charge they make against Jesus there. Um, if basically, who do they attribute his authority to truly be from? If this is similar to some uh, parallel passages or other situations where they uh, talk about how Jesus, uh, uh, they're trying to say that his, his power is from Beelzebub in one passage or, or Beelzebul. And, and looking at that, they're attributing, attributing his power, his work uh, to the uh, satanic forces and to demons. And Jesus says, of course, I don't have a demon. I'm doing my father's will. Uh, in the parallel in Mark, I know that he, or whether it's parallel or whether it's another account, I know that Jesus uh, quotes Abraham Lincoln when he says that a house divided against itself cannot stand. I'm being funny, but, uh, or maybe not. A little but but uh, it was Lincoln, of course, quoting Jesus uh, that a, a house divided doesn't stand. And certainly their reasoning uh, shows how dishonest uh, they really were, uh, that they were not, um, they were not dealing with any integrity with Jesus. They were just trying to say anything about him. They could to stir up, uh, problems. Okay. All right. Well, Brendan, do you have any thoughts on this? <clears throat> Throw to you specifically. I have lots of thoughts. Um, are they good? Yeah, that's another story. Uh, but no, uh, <laughs> I think there, John 8, I think, is a really good lesson for us to think on for a few minutes about uh, being noble-minded. We often cite the Bereans, and that's what we want to do. I think you see the, the antithesis of the Berean mindset here with the Jews. Uh, they, right, they misunderstood the scriptures because of their own prejudice, um, and they were incensed when Jesus spoke truth. You know, for example, uh, previously, when he says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, they just get an, insulted that they would ever, he would ever imply that they were slaves to something. And I, I think we need to, maybe a truth factory moment is when a Bible class or a comment or a point in a sermon kind of makes us have that same reaction. We get a little incensed. We get a little offended. Um maybe before we type that email to the preacher the bible class teacher we need to sit and think on that for a little bit why am i getting offended why am i getting incensed is it because maybe there's some sin in my life that's being addressed maybe there is a failure to do my duty that i have not done um, or maybe my idols have been called out uh, to go back to the pre-show discussion uh, you know good preaching i was reading an article yesterday about this good preaching sometimes hurts and we need to be careful that we're not shooting the messenger because everything Jesus is saying in this, in this chapter, uh, the Jews needed to hear. And it wasn't because Jesus had a, a platform like, hey, I'm just gonna really anger the Jews today. It's, he's exposing their sin and that, does, that doesn't feel good. Now, it's all the Jews of what they do with that. They can either change as some of them would, but the vast majority of them, as Paul would indicate in Romans 9, 10, and 11, majority of them said, no, I don't like this. I'm not going to do anything with this. And, you know, I, I think that's something for all of us to think on. You know, how do I react to when the truth doesn't feel good? Um, do I shoot the messenger or do I do some self-reflection and see, okay, what do I need to change? Why am I reacting that way? 
I think it's a good point. Any thoughts? <clears throat> you know, I, I was reading this this morning and at first I wondered for a, a few seconds why Jesus did not defend himself against the charge of being a Samaritan. And I decided it was because he did not want to besmirch Samaritans. That did not rise to the level of accusing him of having a demon. And uh, he has already pointed out, uh, well, I, I guess the parable of the Good Samaritan takes place earlier than this. I'm not sure since it's in Luke and not John, but there, you know, there were good people and bad people among the Samaritans, uh, just like there were good people and bad people among the Jews. And so just calling him a Samaritan wasn't necessarily an insult, although that was what they're intending to be. But uh, that's what I'm thinking, that he did not want to besmirch the, the Samaritans. But the charge against the, the charge of him having a demon, that was something that needed to be dealt with because he did not want to be in league with the devil or, or even associated with him in the thoughts of any any person uh, because the demon stands opposed the demons plural stand opposed to everything uh everything true because mm -hmm. they are under the sway of satan uh he's the he's the king he's the authority over the demons they are in his kingdom my thinking is that they are the angels that send uh, because the lake of fire was created for the devil and his angels. It doesn't say the devil and his demons. So I'm thinking the angels that sinned are the demons. And so Jesus does not want to be associated with them. And so that's the only uh, charge he really responds to uh, in this. And I thought that was uh, interesting, just thinking those things. But I'm open to other thoughts on that. Well, his approach is a little bit different than like in, in Mark chapter three, where he uses the kingdom divided against itself. He uses logic to, to go against this. Um, but his approach here is different to that. Yeah. Tom, were you going to say? Yeah, I, I, I was just making the observation building of this. I find it interesting that they, they, they use two different terms to describe them. The, yeah. the two most... Mm -hmm the two most detestable terms that they could come up with in their mind. And remember, remember what a Samaritan was to a Jew. You know, uh, the Samaritan was worse than the Gentile because he was a quote-unquote half-breed. You know, so I mean, so there was, there was clear, there's clear prejudice in this. Yeah. And I mean, it's just intended to insult. And, and, and I tell you, anytime somebody uses two terms <laughs> like this, more than likely, it, it it it's nothing but designed to insult. I mean, it it, it basically ninety nine percent of the time it it implies that you've lost your argument. Or we talked or, about that last week. The ad hominies or the, the ad hominem ad, attacks. Ad hominem attacks. Yeah. 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 Not hominy. Yeah. Not yeah. Hominy. yeah. Unless yeah, they've been yeah, pulled. Corn right. is better than hominy. Yeah. Or, 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 so. yeah. <clears throat> I don't like hominy unless it's been pulverized into grits. There you go. <laughs> All right. So, so in his reply, Jesus says to them, he says, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. You know, if he, if he had a demon, he would be trying to honor the demon. You think about it. He says, no, I'm trying to, I am honoring my father, but and by their making this charge against him, they are now dishonoring him. And as the, the normal adage would be, if they dishonored Christ, then they're dishonoring God. If they receive Jesus, they would receive God. Um, reject him, they would then be rejecting God. But he explains then to them in verse 50, and I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Again, this is connected with his statement that he is honoring his father. He's doing his father's will is the continuing thought there within that. So much so to verse 41, he says, most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. All right. So not, not, don't have a demon. I'm honoring the father. 
I'm seeking his glory, not my own. He's the one who will seek and judge. And if you keep my words, you'll never see death. Kind of a summary there of his statement to them. You know, Which in a way, going to go over well. if anyone there had a statement, it would be those who rejected Jesus. Because <laughs> they were the ones who were not honoring God. Well, it makes sense that they would throw this charge at him because he yeah. earlier rightfully accused them of being of their father, the devil. Which would you make know. them a point to demons. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> any thoughts on this? Got a couple. Uh, it, okay. Right now, I'm just uh, a quote from R.L. Whiteside comes to mind from doctrinal discourses that he, he wrote that ignorance often is dogmatic and you, you see that here and and paul paul makes this point in romans 10 the first couple of verses that the jews had a zeal for god but not according to knowledge and therefore because they did not have a knowledge a, a, a knowledgeable zeal they did not know the righteousness of god and because they're ignorant of the righteousness of god they sought to establish their own righteousness and so when you have that you're unaware of how far you've departed and Jesus shows up. He sounds like a heretic because they're not, they don't have the knowledge. They're following their traditions. And Jesus stands opposed to many of those traditions because they're not according to the will of God. And the implication here is, you know, if, if many of these religious leaders had actually sought the law and not what other people said about the law, um, they would have welcomed Jesus with open arms. I mean, you, you go back to Genesis 315, Deuteronomy 18, there's passages of Zechariah, Isaiah. It's all over the Old Testament of the coming Christ, what was going to happen, the Gentiles going to be welcomed. It's everywhere. Uh, and the question is, why didn't they see it? They didn't want to, on one hand. And the other hand is, they actually weren't spending that much time in the Word of God. And again, another Truth Factory moment. Uh, what wells are we drinking from? Yeah. Uh, where are we listening? Are we, you know, are we reading more books about the Bible rather than the Bible? Are we checking our thoughts with the text? Or did we read something in a commentary somewhere and say, oh, I like that. Let's go with that. Now, I say that full aware, aware that all of our backgrounds are our libraries. Um, you know, books can be helpful but they need to be read uh, disproportionately less than what than the Bible. That needs to be primary. That needs to be what we come back to. Because the Pharisees and the Sadducees are great examples of what happens um, when you neglect the Word of God and still try to be godly. That makes sense. Okay. Good point. I really Good know. points. All right, any thoughts? <clears throat> How about from you at home? Do you have any thoughts for us as we go through our study of John chapter 8? We'd love to hear from you. Be sure to drop them into either the chat area on our YouTube channel where you're watching this or on the comment section, in the comment section of the live stream on our Facebook page. Let us know what you have to think about these things. <clears throat> All right, let's... <clears throat> Verse 52 then. Here's how they responded. They said, this is it. We know now that you have a demon. And, and here's why. Because think about it. If anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. All right? Now, we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. So what is it do you think they're trying to, the point they're trying to make here? That maybe Abraham and the prophets weren't really following God? Because if they did, they would still be alive? Or... Is he promising eternal physical life to people who are more faithful than these? I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what is their point behind this statement here. I think they're just making the observation that Abraham and, and the prophets are dead. I, 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 yeah. I think they're, they're seeing it physically. And, and so well, that, that's, kind of the direction, that that's the direction that I think they're going. And Jesus is talking about you won't see death. They were righteous and they died. So obviously, uh, so obviously you're wrong because even righteous people die. And yeah. I, I, so, at, but there's obviously, that's not the way Jesus meant it. 
we know that. Well, and to that point, um, I, I, I'm going to agree with that, and I think the answer is too in the beginning of verse 53. Are you greater than our father Abraham? Mm -hmm. You have to remember that first century Judaism among the religious teachers, Abraham and Moses were, per, I mean, they weren't deified in the same way that the Romans deified their gods, but it was pretty, pretty close. I mean, you read some of the Talmud, um, there's claims that Abraham kept the law of Moses perfectly before it ever was given. I mean, that it's a, they really put these guys up on a pedestal and the whole, it's, I think there's almost another insult here that who are you? You're some teacher from the backwater of Galilee. You're not Abraham. You're not Moses. They died. They couldn't give us life. So who are you to say that if we keep your teaching that we're going to live forever? Um, yeah, again, to Tom's point, they just cannot see another way of looking at this other than their own way. And that that ends up being the biggest stumbling block to them. Yeah. And, and, and again, it's not just cannot, it's will not. Or, or, or the blindness is the reason they can't see it. And that goes to your first Corinthians one and two. And he had already said that he, he came bringing the word of God. And so to accept his words worked, was to accept the words of God. And so Abraham accepted the words of God, even though they weren't spoken by Jesus at that time. Uh, they didn't have a red letter in the scroll of, Ab of Isaiah. Uh, but uh, so, it, yeah, of course, he is greater than Abraham. And he says that down in verse 58, which we'll get to later. But uh, yeah, they, they, I think they, the idea of spiritual death was beyond them. Mm -hmm. I don't think they could conceive at this point of a spiritual death. And, uh, and, and yet Jesus, how many times did he say, and Paul had to say this also, write this several times. He, uh, you're dead, but, but, uh, alive, but dead, uh, Paul makes that statement to Timothy regarding some of the widows that were uh, had, had <clears throat> God. Uh, they were alive physically, but dead spiritually. And Paul makes that statement also, or that point also in Romans chapter uh, chapter eight. And so we need to keep that in mind. Well, it's something that we don't really comprehend except for what the Bible teaches on it. That's right. And we accept it more as a matter of fact that without Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, separated from God. Yeah. All right, let's see. <clears throat> you know what, I don't want to belabor the point, but would the clo would something that, that might have come close to that be the equivalent of when someone um, was defiled and could not go into the temple, could not go before God? It would be the same as spiritual death, but they would see a separation they were defiled versus being consecrated, maybe. Yeah, they would not be eligible yeah. to go back into the temple until they had the ceremonial cleansing. Yeah, so therefore it's separated that, in a that, sense that, from God. It was a type of death. Yeah. It was a, a, a social death, which uh, it, I don't know that it was spiritual death. No. Uh, well, talking about they're, they're comprehending something that may be along similar lines of separated from God. Yeah, that, that's what they would think. Uh, and yeah. you'd think they would at least apply that here. But they yeah. think a little about that. Well, let's continue forward. <clears throat> and Bob's already uh, kind, of, kind of pointed us towards this here in a minute, where Jesus is going to basically make the point that he is greater than Abraham. And so let, let's start there in verse, Bob, if you would read for us. Let's start in verse 54, and let's read through verse 59, if you would, please. 54 through 59, New King James. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. 
And he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. This in the 59. Then he took, uh, they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, <coughs> going through the midst of them, and so passed by. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bob. So backing up now to verse 54, <clears throat> we, when, when we study passages like this, we have to keep in mind that Jesus is speaking from the perspective of a human man standing in front of them. Okay. We recognize and understand his deity and his authority, but it is within this very, very particular point in time where he, he credits the Father as to the reason why he has come. He came to do the will of his Father. And it's not about the Father um, honoring him. It is about him honoring the Father. But the reality is, of course, the Father does honor him. And when they reject him, they're rejecting the one whom the Father had sent. And so he makes that statement there in verse 54, that if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me of whom you say that he is your God. Um, but the problem is, Bob, he says that yet you have not known him, but I know him. You think about going all the way back to even when God called Abraham, he's telling them that the descendants of Abraham, you people have not known God. And that's been the fundamental problem with the, 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 the Israelites in their history. They fundamentally did not know God. They could have and should have and some did of sorts. But as a people and these leaders here, they don't know him. Yeah, that gets back to the discussion that uh, Brian and I had before we went live. Yeah. Uh, that they did not worship the one true and living God even while Jesus was alive here. Uh, because they didn't know him. You can't worship somebody that you don't know. They didn't know him. They did not understand him. Their knowledge of him, as has already been implied, came through the, the, the commentaries of the day rather than from their knowledge and understanding and appreciation of what he had said. And, uh, you know, later when in Acts chapter 6, when Stephen is uh, is preaching, uh, the Jews accuse him of forsaking God, turning their turning his back upon Moses and the temple. Well, it was them; they had done that, mm -hmm. and they had long ago done that before Jesus appeared on the scene. And I think this is one of the valleys that John the Baptist said would be filled: uh, the gap. Uh, in the knowledge and understanding of the Jews concerning God. And, uh, but it, that gap, that valley can only be filled uh, for those who uh, are willing to uh, listen and, 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 and strive to understand uh, what God would have them to do. Okay. <clears throat> Good point. Any thoughts? I've got, a, I've got a, something that may be something equivalent to what you're talking about, them claiming to know God, but they did not. They weren't worshiping the one true God. John says something similar of a sort in 1 John chapter 1. In the, or maybe it isn't similar. You can tell me what you think about this. He says, if anyone says he has fellowship with God and walks in darkness, he lies and the truth is not in him. Is there a sense, although we may verbally and by biblical verses uh, worship the right God, if you would. Okay. But if in our lives we're walking in darkness, then we are, are we any different than these religious leaders of the day? Claiming we know God when we don't. Go ahead. I'll jump. Yeah, we're we're not uh, because and I this is where Romans two I think really hits home why he's talking about 
what some have called the righteous Jew and everything, you you put that in modern American context, I'm like, and who are you, old man, who's been raised in the church, who knows the 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 covenants, who knows the plan of salvation? Do you teach another, and yet you practice the? I mean, it's this, it's the same thing. You can have all the knowledge of God, but if you don't live it and put it into practice, there's the problem. And you know, we have to remind ourselves that first century Judaism was not the Judaism of the old covenant. It, it just wasn't. It doesn't match up the way it's supposed to. That covenant, as Paul says in, first, in Romans 7, was holy, righteous, and good, but it was temporary. It had a purpose. And if one lived underneath it, one could have a healthy relationship with their God. And I think that under that underscores the sad reality of most of Israel's history is they chose not to. And that, I mean, that's, and that's the same point for today. We, you can have the right doctrines, you can worship the right way, you can even, you know, worship the right God. But if you are not living by the covenant, it does no one any good. So both are equally important. Some say, well, yeah. right practice is the only thing that's... No, you got to have doctrine to match the practice. They have to be united. And I think that's what Jesus points out in John chapter 4 of spirit and in truth. You, they, you, you get those two out of balance, you know, things happen. Ephesus and Revelation had all doctrine. And yet Jesus said they, lost, they left their first love. And yet, you had other churches that were giving to the poor and all that kind of stuff. And Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, says, well, we we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons. But Jesus said, you didn't know me. And so, both are important there. So, um, yeah, we can fall into the same trap as they did if we're not careful. And it, yeah. the theme of this chapter, we just got to keep coming back to the Word and abiding in the Word of Christ and make sure we're living by it. Exactly. Exactly. John, there's something that occurs to me here, <clears throat> and I don't want to get off topic from, from the current discussion, but but uh, Jesus talks about receiving honor. And I think maybe one of the, the great points here, and one of the things that Jesus, when he, he humbled himself and took on flesh and uh, walked on this earth and the way he was treated, uh, we often talk about the, the suffering there at the end. But here, when he, uh, Revelation describes him as the lamb that was slain, but uh, stood up and took the scroll. And uh, here, you know, he describes himself as uh, before Abraham was, I am. And here he's due such tremendous honor as the Christ, as uh, the Son of God, the King, uh, the Savior. Uh, he, he's due such great honor, but yet... Uh, he was shown none virtually uh, from all those uh, who should have been recognizing him more than anyone else. Those who were brought up in, in the Jewish religion, those who were uh, the children of Abraham, they should have known him and they didn't. And so when he discusses honor here, it it is kind of almost heartbreaking to realize how Jesus was uh, treated uh, when he should have had such... Um, incredible honor and glory given to him yeah you, you know yeah. and don't forget in, in that point paul's making there just by way of reminder uh, jesus backed up his claims over and over and over by by his attitude as well as the work the miracles that he did he he backed it up and 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 that's the whole thing that uh, I guess when we look at it in hindsight, hindsight is so baffling to us how they could reject them. Yeah, that's a good point. Any other any other thoughts on that? You know, you mentioned First John a uh, while well ago, John. Uh, in in First John four and verse uh, ten, uh, it wasn't verse ten; it was verse 40, 45. Or 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in him, abides in God, and God in him. 
Then in chapter 5 and verse 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot him, also loves him who is begotten of him. And so that really applies here in, in the Gospel of John. John draws on what Jesus said, uh, and he does this so many times in his epistles, on what Jesus said as recorded by John himself in the gospel, in his gospel. And so, uh, and and I, I can't find it right now, but there's also a statement in 1 John that you can't have the Father and not have the Son, and you can't reject the Son without rejecting the Father. Uh, that's also in 1 John. I just can't find the, uh, the passage right now. And so, again, if you're worshiping a God who has no son, you're not worshiping the one true and living God. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a good point. Um, we have a comment that has come in through the Facebook side of the world from Stephanie. And um, I'm going to bring it in. In referencing King Josiah, in Jeremiah 22, 15 through 17, seems to me to imply that King Josiah showed that he knew God through his actions. Now, the passage here being referenced reads as follows. Shall you reign because you enclose yourself in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He, and I, he's talking about Josiah, if, if I've got this right. He judged the cause of the poor and needy, then it was well. Was not this knowing me, says the Lord? Yet for your eyes and your heart are for nothing but, sorry, yet your eyes and your heart are for nothing but your covetousness for shedding innocent blood and practicing oppression and violence there. Any thoughts about uh, Stephanie's comment there? And more directed to 16, he judged the, um, was not this knowing me, says the Lord, talking about his obedience to the Lord. <clears throat> well, if makes me at, oh, Brian, go ahead. I was going to say, it makes me think of Titus one sixteen, where it talks about people that profess to know God, but in their works, they deny him. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of have to think that that might be a little bit of what's going on uh, in uh, Jeremiah's accusation against Josiah's sons, that he's trying to point out that uh, Josiah knew God because his works demonstrated that he knew God. And uh, we're told many times that our works demonstrate we believe God, our works demonstrate that we uh, trust God. First uh, John, he says, uh, or eight, if you know, if you don't love one another, you don't know God. Um, for God is love. So, so there is there is an element to say to know God is. And so Stephanie makes a really neat point. And Stephanie, I, I really appreciate that comment out of Jeremiah because that's pretty that's pretty neat um, to, about Josiah, my, one of my favorite king. Um, yeah. that, uh, it really is, uh, it really is important that he was saying he knew me because his works, uh, demonstrated that he knew me. So that's a great point. Yeah. Um, Brendan. Um, well, that was a pretty good comment Brian made. So, uh, <laughs> no, I was going to say is just, yeah, I mean, it shows, uh, I think the Jeremiah passage does show that just because you have a good godly parents is not a guarantee that you yourself are going to get that transmitted, you have to still make that decision. You have to still make that an ownership. Josiah is really interesting because, you know, there's a nameless prophet that prophesies about his reign several, like, long before he ever uh, is born. He restores a lot of the worship in the land. He gets the people right. But we see that even a top-down approach to restoration doesn't have any staying power unless the people themselves from the ground up are converted themselves and ryan's point you know uh micah 6 8 it's the same thing where god says to know me is to love justice and to do kindness and to walk humbly with him uh you know this is where it's kind of baffling to me that we're in this country we even have to have this whole faith and works discussion because it's a distinction the bible never makes it's a distinction that uh the early church never made and you know, um, we will be judged on our works. Now, it's important to know that that there's unhealthy tension and then there's healthy tension. So if we are trying to indebt God because of our works, that's never going to, that's not going to work. That's not going to happen. But because we know we're saved and we have a relationship with him, we 
then act accordingly. We live right out of appreciation. We're going to be judged based on how well, in part, did we live in light of our calling in the gospel. And so I would say there's a healthy tension there. But if you're thinking that it's, hey, it's all up to me, uh, that that's going to create a miserable person, much like the person we see in the end of Romans 7 there. So uh, works do matter. Josiah is a great example of how works show your knowledge of God. Yeah, that's a good point. It, you know, it's possible to do works, but not truly believe. You know, yeah. But the point, and even with Josiah, the works, you cannot separate. If you have faith, you can't separate obedience from that. Genuine faith and obedience are interwoven together. Uh, if, the, if the obedience is there, then the faith is not the genuine faith that it should be. Yeah. Good question. Good question, Stephanie. I appreciate that. Or good point, really. All right, let's see. <clears throat> oh, a couple of things here real quick as we uh, pull up this little uh, last section here to close for a moment there. Jesus basically says, you know, if, he, if I was to say, I do not know him, then Jesus says he would be a liar. Jesus would be a liar if he was to say that. Because the truth is he knows the Father and keeps his word. Contrasting it, of course, with the Pharisees who claimed to know God, but did not keep his word. Um, but then verse 56, <clears throat> this is kind of the big one there. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of questions that if we really wanted to kind of throw the railroad tracks and send the train off in another direction there, I think might make for an interesting discussion, but time of course does not permit quite everything like that. But <clears throat> this statement right here tells us for a fact that Abraham was in the kingdom of God. Okay. And this isn't the only verse that reference references that idea that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were in the kingdom of God. But Abraham is at a vantage point, if you, if you would. I right, was speaking somewhat figuratively, but where Abraham was, is, he saw the day of Jesus come, and he was glad. That gives us a lot of hope, not just because of the death of Christ, but here's a case in point of, of Jesus himself who says, Abraham survived. Abraham is still living. Um, any thoughts or any comments about this? Don't you think that when uh, Abraham actually had Isaac born, uh, you know, after all the efforts to <laughs> help God out with his promise, uh, mm -hmm. that he, he was convinced, you know, Galatians 3.8 uh, says that uh, the gospel was preached to Abraham beforehand in uh, saying, in you, all nations will be blessed. Yep. Uh, and so I think maybe there's a, a thought there that, you know, Abraham, it, you know, when we read about faith in in Hebrews 11 uh, or Hebrews 1, actually, uh, we under, we come to understand that faith is something we know, we see, uh, and Abraham knew it. Uh, he, you know, he saw it, uh, even though it was yeah. by faith he received that, uh, and he, he knew that that would come, and he was glad. So. Maybe that's an oversimplification. I don't know, but but just a thought. Uh, you know, go ahead, Bob. Who else was starting to speak? Go ahead, Let Bob. Me, I'll go. Okay, thank you, Brenda. Uh, also, I think I think it had already been established by uh, Moses and by Jesus, and quoting Moses, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had survived physical death. To me here, he is saying your your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. I think he's saying he saw it in his mind's eye with the eye of faith. And and what uh, uh, Paul just said made me think of this uh, that he saw, he saw it when Je when when uh, Isaac was born. Uh, God is going to fulfill His promise to me. All nations will be blessed through me. And through my through my descendants, and uh, and this this gave rise to their saying, "You're not 50 years old, and you seen Abraham." Well, Ab while Abraham might not have seen Jesus, Jesus saw Abraham. 
because Jesus had always existed. He existed prior to Abraham. And so before Abraham was, I am. And that's ego emi. Uh, that's what God the Father uh, or the Godhead said to Moses to tell the people my name. If they ask you, tell them I am sent you. And so he okay. ties that to Jesus does. All right. Brendan? <clears throat> Uh, due to time, let's. I'm gonna forego that. Let's maybe cut to the question we just got. Oh, okay. I was busy looking away. <laughs> let's bring that up then. <clears throat> Lori asks the question: How does verse 56 confirm Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were in the kingdom? Please explain further for me. I am so glad you asked that question because <laughs> I do want to clear. I do want to clarify what I was saying there. In the Gospel of Mark, specifically, let me bring it up here real quick. No, Matthew. I'm sorry, not Mark. There we go. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. And we'll come back to verse 56. Uh, the way I said that was a little bit, little bit out of order. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. I think verse 8 and 11 gives assurance there that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all in fellowship with God and are in the kingdom of heaven in, in that respect there. The point that I was making here wasn't so much that this verse says that they were in the kingdom of heaven, but that Abraham was living, you know, he was aware when the Lord came, saw these events as they unfolded, and we know from another passage, and I didn't say that clearly over in Matthew, that um, he appears to be in the kingdom of heaven. Now, having said that, I may be off a little bit. Now, after y'all's explanation some of this verse here, in verse 56 there, what you're, what you're suggesting there, it's not so much that from uh, Abraham's eternal abode, he rejoiced when he saw Jesus come to this earth. <clears throat> that, yeah, that in other words, understood oh, Brent is saying as well. That in other words, uh, so the, I guess there's two ways you're looking at this. One is mm -hmm. that Abraham currently was seeing Jesus's coming, uh, a testimony to that. But there's also the possibility that what it's describing is that in Abraham's lifetime, he saw uh, the coming of Christ. Hebrews 11, um, uh, 13, where it says, you know, from, a, you know, even though dad, he saw from afar the city that was yeah. coming and rejoiced in it. So, you know, that it could be a Hebrews 11 uh, reference as well. Uh, the third possibility is uh, Abraham met God at one point, too. So um, maybe maybe that's also what he's talking about, that he well, you, if he met heavy, God, he might have met Jesus. Yeah. In the heavy vision. And it says 18. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah well, whenever the three well, men came well, to see him. Yeah, yeah, that too. exactly. The one is described. And, you know, sometimes that argument's made uh, uh, about there are occasions where the wording for someone visiting, it's as if God were there. And, and, and I've sometimes made the argument that there's the possibility that the possibility <clears throat> that that actually is Jesus interacting in the Old Testament. You can't prove that. But but that's the case, uh, you know, tying everything to this first, you know, Bob, Bob made a point that I think is significant here. And, and that is the fact that a whole lot of this is more about the fact that while Abraham was alive, Jesus was there. Somehow, somehow Ab Abraham knew about Jesus. And uh, Jesus is making the point as I was there. And, and w whether it was physical or whether it's just the fact that he is God. Uh, when you look at verse 57, the reply that they made, you know, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. Obviously, the way Jesus said it, they understood that Jesus was saying, I was there with Abraham. I, I literally saw these things about Abraham. They may have been written down, uh, you know, somewhere. I'm not sure that these exact words are found in the life of Abraham in Genesis. But Jesus knew that they were there, and somehow they understand it. Now, I don't understand enough about Greek. Uh, the word saw is an aorist tense, active, 
indicative indicative verb, you know, you know, for for whatever that's worth. Um, um, but the point is, is Jesus was there, and that's what they replied to. So, and okay. a, a quick point here, I think we just need to remind ourselves sometimes that the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. It's not an exhaustive account. It can't be. Uh, God even told us that in Deuteronomy 29, 29, there are things he did not reveal. John even tells us in his gospel, I didn't write everything there was about the, about Jesus because it's impossible to. They're not, there's not enough paper in the world. The Bible is an incredibly streamlined book. Uh, the Pentateuch, Genesis, um, as much as we want a lot of answers to a lot of questions, yeah. the first 11 chapters like, okay, we're going to give you the, the quick version of from creation to Abraham because we got to get this people coming out of Egypt refreshed on their own history. I think we should just appreciate that when Jesus tells us something, that like, hey, I was there. I was there in Abraham's day. Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. We may not be able to point back to a specific verse in the Old Testament, but that doesn't negate the, the truth claim of that. And I, I, I like the theme of the little Easter eggs in the New Testament, like, oh, well, oh, I mean, you could go to the general epistles, you know, I don't remember ever reading about the Archangel Michael debu debating with Satan over the body of Moses, but apparently that happened. That's interesting. And, you know, you, you're left wondering, you want more, but you, yeah. you just have to move on because the New Testament writers like, okay, just take this happened. Yeah. Um, I'm making my point with this. And I, I think it's very interesting uh, kind of tying the last couple of verses together. You know, sometimes people will say, well, where did Jesus ever say he was God directly? I'm like, well, verse 58 is one place. It's yeah. the only other place in the Old Testament where an I am statement like that is made is God to Moses at the burning bush. I am who I am. And Jesus is directly quoting that here. Um, so I would aim in all the other comments that were made. It's just at some point, you know, Jesus communed and conversed with Abraham uh, and the other patriarchs. And, you know, I, I think that's just very interesting. And again, yeah. this kind of highlights the Jew, Jewish response. It's just they just could not fathom um, that being a possibility. Uh, if, if God's in the flesh, then well, he still has his memories of when he talked with Abraham. So that's right. Yeah. That's and, right. and that they got it is clearly pointed out by verse 59. Uh, what I mean is yeah. they got the point that Jesus was making is, is, is there in verse 59. You can't misunderstand. You can't misunderstand that Jesus is claiming deity. Cause you, he made you, himself God in, yes. in this statement in, you know, the, their, their anger against him. They saw him in sin. An interesting study that we don't have time to for today, but something for maybe the audience to think about and maybe do this week. Um, I think you can learn a lot about who Jesus is through the testimony of his enemies. You ever just study what his adversaries said about him? I think you get a, these are, these are the points that were irrefutable. Like they understood clearly from his teaching. So sometimes the current argument is, well, the, the divinity thing that got made up later. Well, we got inspired sources and non-inspired sources of, of the testimony of Jesus enemies saying, Hey, you're nuts. Why are you saying you're God? So yeah. that, that was a clear point that was made in the preaching of Jesus. I, I think it's just a really interesting study when you just limit yourself to what is his enemies say? What are they agreeing on? Does it agree with his testimony? You know, it, it's, it, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, really so. Really so. Well, I think that's about, we were right at the top of the hour, maybe one minute past, and that brings us to the end of John chapter 8. I think it would be a good stopping point. Next week, we'll pick up with John chapter 9. Sound good? Yeah, yeah. We do need, we may need to touch a little more on the I am, I don't know, but other than that. And especially verse 59, I think we need to say a few words about that next week. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's a good point. So let's plan to do that. Let's plan to, to kind of pick up right around verse 58, um, final discussions on the two verses, and then we'll flip over into John chapter 9. Sound good? All righty. Well, 
Paul already grew tired of us and has departed our company for today. That's all right. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us for our study. By way of a quick reminder, if you want to reach out to us, you can send email to questions at truthfactorlive.com or you can email us individually. Um, we'd love to hear from you, hear what you have to say. And if it's something that we can bring into the study, then we will, of course, do that. All right, well, that's it for now. We'll plan to be back here again next Thursday, 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time, as we continue course on our study through the Gospel of John. And we'll pick up here in chapter 8, verse 58. I right, appreciate it, y'all. You have a wonderful week, and we'll see y'all next time. Bye-bye.